How's everyone doing? Who's heard of speculative design? Raise your hand. Awesome, good. Um, <clears throat> so I, I run a small meetup in San Francisco. Uh, we have about 720 plus members right now. It's all in speculative design. And uh, we host workshops and have speakers all around this topic. And uh, if you don't watch, has anyone listened to the podcast 99% Invisible? 99 Invisible? Yeah. There's a really great uh, episode called 10,000 Years. So <clears throat> in the middle of the New Mexico desert, there is this nuclear waste dump. And they are burying these large canisters of nuclear waste. And it said the, the site activity is about 250,000 years. And they put out this call for speakers. Um, and this was the actual uh, uh, overview. So to create a marker system that remain operational during the performance periods have 10,000 years, because I thought 250,000 years is a long time. So we'll just tell them, tell them it's 10,000 years. A marker system to let people know that this is a dangerous place, right? So they, they, um, they call up some material science people, climatology, artists, architects, philosophers, to create this symbol system, yeah? <clears throat> so, uh, you know, you might think this is an easy job, right? We'll just put some skull and crossbones, and that means death, right? See these things. But, you know, over time, symbols can change and shift. Do you know that the skull and crossbones actually meant rebirth? It showed up in uh, religious paintings at the foot of Jesus' Jesus's, uh, crucifix, which are actually the bones of Adam. It wasn't until around the 1700s that... Uh, Captain uh, Calico Jack, a pirate, was actually prosecuted, and he used it as a symbol of death. This was his symbol. So, okay, that's not going to work. We're not going to use skull and crossbones. So what about storyboarding? We'll just use a comic strip, right? Pictographs work really well. So we'll just draw this picture, and we'll put the radioactive symbol. No one will know what it means, but we'll show this guy approaching it. You know, he'll walk away, suddenly has the symbol on him. He's absorbed it. He gets sick, falls over dead. Great, but if you read it backwards, dying man touches canister, releases death onto the canister, and now it's the fountain of youth. <laughs> Symbols change over time. <clears throat> so the architect said, okay, we're gonna create these spires. It's gonna look really uninviting. So when anyone, anyone sees it, they're not gonna wanna go there because it looks thorny until maybe a thousand years from now when artists and archeologists come and see the site and they say, wow, Let's build a hotel, maybe a casino, and let's date it all up and see what's underneath, right? <clears throat> so then the philosophers came in. They said, what has, what has actually, oops, over time, totally sh I showed you the punchline. Over time, what has actually lasted over time, right? What's the most durable thing? Religion, folklore, um, belief systems. Those have lasted thousands and thousands of years. So the philosopher said, why don't we make up this uh, story about these cats? They can be genetically engineered, and every, anytime they're around radiation or anything toxic, they're gonna glow. We'll call them the ray cats. And this is the story that people will learn and believe over the next 10,000 years. Now, I'm not here to talk about cats. I'd love to talk about cats and ray cats, but I'm here to talk to you about speculative design. Some things on this world, on this planet, are imminent. Radioactivity, death, terrorism, some of the very negative things that we have to face with as a society, as a race. How do we plan for the future? How do we speculate about the challenges to come, the opportunities, the ethical challenges, how it affects us as a society? Spectre design has many names. You could look it up right now on Google, and you might actually find critical design. Design fiction, discursive design, interrogative design, adversarial design, design probes, ludic design, which actually just means playful. For all intents and purposes, and for any academics that are in the audience today, this is all pretty much the same thing, speculative design. If you look at the definition for critical design, it's actually coined by Anthony Dunn in the 1990s in his book called Hertzian Tales. Him and Fiona Raby were professors at the Royal College of Art in London. They ran a program called Designing Interactions. And it was really to label the type of work that was coming out of there that was culturally and socially impacting. 
to address the ethical challenges of design, its role and impact in the future. These were probes, scenarios, artifacts they created to question the emerging technologies that we have to face and all the challenges and opportunity, opportunities amongst it. Speck of design, general, is a, a method, a vehicle for manifesting possibilities, to prepare us for the challenges of the future, sometimes inconvenient. Sometimes it's utopic, and sometimes it's dystopic. Sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable for us to face the truth of where our world is heading. I know I'm pretty uncomfortable with the fact that Trump is on the ballot right now. But we create these scenarios, we create these conversations so that we can understand what we have to face and we can design a more preferable path towards the future. When we do this work, we, we like to show this diagram, it's called the Futures Cone. So imagine time. You can't really predict the future, right? But there's some things straight through the center of the cone that are imminent. There are some things that are probable. But there are also other outcomes and other alternate futures that live on the outskirts, the plausible and the possible. Now, as you start to go outside of the cone, you're thinking about fantasy and things that we can't actually achieve. Well, maybe not yet, like teleportation or lightsabers. Those things are, we don't seem to play them. Okay, so in the middle, what is likely to happen? There are things that we can actually predict are likely to happen. Overpopulation, disease, terrorism. I know it's kind of grim, don't worry. And then on the outs outskirts, the plausible, what could happen? Now these are the areas we like to play in inspective design to figure out what are the alternate futures that we might have to face. The challenges that are taboo, the challenges that are dark, or the challenges and opportunities that create a perfect society for us. And the, out the outskirts, the possible, what might happen? This is where we like to play in, in the preferable zone. Things we have a little bit of confidence in, we can actually anchor some sort of technology to. We know for sure we're going to solve it in the next five to 10 years. And then we create basically this explosion of the holistic world of how it's going to impact the future. How might we understand how our designed objects, services, will actually live in this world, in this ecosystem? What is that ecosystem going to be like? What do we want? And the wrong thing come up, but what do we want to do? Wild cards are especially fun to work with because they live on the outskirts and the possible, but also are, are wild. You never think of them before. You'd never think of taking these two ideas and mashing them up. You'd never think about relationships and technology. We throw all these things into the world and don't really understand how they actually affect us as a society. We just think about our users because people are going to adopt them, they're going to pay the money, but we don't think of it as a, a, an ecosystem as a whole. These wild cards are low probability events, probability events, scenarios which occurred. They might have high impact. Some of these wild cards might be dangerous. Some of them might actually be innovative. Dunn and Raby did a project called Designs for an Overpopulated Planet, Foragers. The UN says in the next 40 years, we're going to have to present 70, create 70% 70 more food for the world. Think about that for a second. 70% more food, 70% more fish out of the sea, 70% more water that has to be used for all the power plants to run the farms, the animals, the food to feed the animals. That's a lot of food for this planet. Now what if, because speculative and critical design always asks what if, what could be, what might happen? What if we were able to harness the chemical biology of what animals use to actually extract nutrients from the soil, the air, the water? If we could harness that and synthesize it into a, a biological mechanism, could societies use that to actually extract food the way animals do. What would those new prototypes look like? And what would be the form? Would they mimic animals? How would we use them? How would these new subcultures roam the land, extracting nutrients? Because we have to, we're forced to. What color would they be? Another project, Evidence Dolls, was a study on the impact of genetic technology on women's lives, their love lives in particular. They gave this doll to, um, to a group of women to elicit how they might feel about biotech on their relationships. Each one of them was white at first, and they actually colored them and painted them based on the relationship that, or the person that they actually dated. And right there in the center, there's a drawer that you pull out and put a piece of their DNA, a sample. This DNA could be analyzed to figure out if they're actually a good mate. So 
unlocking the imagination based, this is, this is just a doll, but a clear trajectory of how we might use biotech and DNA and genomics to understand how it might affect our relationships. Little did we know 10 years ago that we would actually be swiping left and right on our phones to find a date. It would have seemed very odd back then, but we are doing it today, and this is actually a very normal, commonplace way for us to actually create relationships these days. Object Solutions, another agency, did a project with MIT, or it was an ex exhibition at MIT called Love Optimize. So imagine this, on your first date, hooked up to electrodes, and the electrodes send these evocative nerve impulses between both of you, calibrating your nervous systems, to amplify your points of greatest harmony to see if you're actually compatible. This is real technology, but placed in another situation of where we might actually be able to use it for our love lives. This uh, project's called Intimating. Imagine if your relationship was governed by your smart home, because we're all gonna have them one day. The more intimate you are, you have full services, lights, AC, utilities, but the minute you start to dissolve that relationship and you're less intimate with your partner, your house shuts down. <laughs> These are just ideas based on real technology we've projected to see how they might affect different parts of our lives. Not just that the smart home is smart, but how it might affect the way that we are, we communicate, or how could we use it to communicate, better our lives. A little bit creepy, but you know, it creates a platform for synthesis of how we can use these technologies. Joseph Popper did a project called One Way Ticket. So he built this capsule, and when you look at this uh, project online, it's really more about the capsule and the, the uh, design research he did. But the idea was, what would it be like if we sent someone on a one-way ticket out into the middle of outer space? What are the challenges around that? Psychologically, behaviorally, what would you eat? How would you pass time? How would you entertain yourself? All of these questions arise. Not too far different from what we're doing today with Mars One and what Elon Musk is, is proposing to do. In fact, he said recently, to get on Mars One or to, to go to Mars, you should be prepared for death. You should be prepared to live the rest of your life on Mars. What are the challenges there? To pull it out of the grim. Now, if you are living on Mars, what are some of the other things you might want? What is luxury there? Carlos Manleon Gendel did a project called Martian Wine, and he looked at, well, what if we wanted wine? You know, that's a simple luxury, right? Could we produce wine on Mars? Truth is, yes. Through a process called carbonic maceration, you can actually take grapes, expose them to a lot of carbon dioxide and pressure, and actually make them ferment from the inside out. Because Mars' atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide and only 0.3% oxygen, which is, I don't know why, why are we going to Mars? <laughs> but if we had to, and you had to live there, you could actually make some wine. So that's great. And from the components of the soil, uh, Martian soil, he created these vases, so you can actually create the vases out of, out of Martian soil. So it all worked. We'd probably be happy. Some things are imminent. Ray Kurzweil, who is a uh, futurist working for Google at the moment, says genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics will provide the means to overcome age-old problems and such illness and poverty. It also empower de destructive ideologies. This is true, we all know this is true. Gen genetics, part of our lives. Nanotechnology, we're working on it. And robotics and artificial intelligence, they are on the way. Some people ridicule Ray, Ray Kurzweil because he talks a lot about the singularity. Do you guys know what the singularity is? That we're all gonna become robots basically one day. It's kind of a scary idea. Artificial intelligence is a real thing. It used to be only something of sci-fi. It will either be the angel or demon that allows us as a race, a human race, to survive or die out. Aggie Haynes, she's one of my favorite designers, she uses, um, she talks a lot about body manipulation. So today we use a lot of, um, we can, through plastic surgery, modify ourselves, our skin, mostly for vanity. Now what if? This is real technology. We had to modify our children to acclimate themselves to a world with deepening climate change, hotter temperatures. This child has been modified with more skin on his head. It acts like a heat sink in a computer. The more surface area, the more it cools off the body. What would stop us from actually having to modify our children to survive in this world or in another? Another project she did called New Plastics. So, 
in a world, in a future, where plastic production can be reduced for economic and environmental purposes, what if we could use plants to gestate things like resin, plastic? Could we use organic material to create materials that we could use for other objects? These are all questions, again, taking two different ideas and looking at them, projecting them to the future and how might we use these services to deal with the challenges we might have environmentally. Alexander Daisy Ginsburg, also another favorite of mine, she works a lot with synthetic biology and bacteria. So on the left here, this is a glass made from keratin, bacteria that produce keratin. Keratin is the protein in your skin, your nails, and your, your hair to actually give it uh, strength. Where would you find this in Target? Would this be in the plant section or the houseware section? On the left, this is a pollution-sensing lung tumor designed from glass fiber fabricating bacteria from the pathology of a heavy smoker. You could place it into a room where there might be toxins in the air and it would glow red. This technology exists, but again, dealing with issues that we might have to face and how we might mash up some ideas and sciences and project them. This is a project called eChromai. As designers, we worked with the team to explore eChromai's potential as they were developing it in the lab. And together, we imagined a timeline proposing ways that living colour could evolve over the next century. These scenarios, some of which are shown in this film, explore the different agendas that could shape eChromai's use and in turn our everyday lives. One of the first real applications for this technology may arrive quite soon. A cheap disposable biosensor for testing groundwater contaminated by arsenic. Bacteria could also be used to produce natural colourings and dyes. By 2015, there may be a profession of people who hunt for new pigments in the genes responsible, bringing them back for use in the food and textile industry. By 2039, you can go to the supermarket and buy the simple probiotic yoghurt for cheap personalised disease monitoring. The yoghurt drink contains E. bacteria, which establish a colony in your gut. They monitor for chemical signals that indicate the presence of a wide range of diseases. If they detect a disease, they start generating the corresponding coloured pigment producing an easily visible output to prompt you to seek your doctor. I love that project. <laughs> you see, design can set agendas. Ekromai was a real technology that she developed with seven Cambridge University students. And they looked out several decades to see how might Ekromai evolve, what new business models, what services, what jobs might be needed to actually have this as working a, a positive impact on society. Everything that we design can be looked at that way. There are new business models around everything. And you can set an agenda forward. If it's powerful enough to change the future, you can set that path with your company. I'm going to talk about two projects right now. Respective design is actually being used at a government level. So TellArt, who is an agency uh, based out of London, worked with the government of Dubai. So uh, Dubai is an interesting place because it was built in the middle of the desert on oil money, but needed to sustain itself. So they knew that oil was going to run out. So they're a very future forward, future thinking uh, society, city. And they worked with Telar to design this Museum of Future Government Services. The name of it has changed. Now it's called the Museum of the Future. It used to be just this annual exhibition where they looked at current emerging technologies and how things might play out and the services that the government might have to provide. So they have this smart street and they have uh, augmented reality and drones, construction drones, and this is how the future might be, the very near future. Construction drone is not too far ahead, but what about the programmer of the construction drone? What about the person who has to maintain it? All these jobs and services. So it's meant to actually enlist the public opinion of, do you want this? And if you do, what are we not thinking of? What do you need? And how are we gonna uh, adopt and implement this into our, our city? They create an autonomous prototyping lab. So if you don't have to drive your car, what can we do with it? This was in, this was two years ago when it wasn't such a popular thing. But if you're not driving, can we work out? So right there you can see the, uh, the workout car. And there's a business uh, meeting car here to elicit new ideas. Because now we've got that figured out, what else can we do? Exoskeletons, brain augmentation, machine learning, all these type of predictive analytics, what can we do with it? Can we fight crime? Will we know crime before it happens? This is starting to sound a lot like Minority Report. Uh, mood view. So this is, a, this is a really interesting one. Here, check out the video. 
Have you ever had trouble convincing people of your ideas? Well, despair no more. Introducing MoodView, the most advanced social intelligence product on the market. MoodView's sensitive facial micro-expression recognition reveals people's subconscious feelings and attitudes in real time. The MoodView Social Coach then draws from a data bank of over 450 trillion social interactions to suggest the best way to respond. Thanks to MoodView, you can read people like an open book and be sure that you say the right thing at the right time, every time. MoodView. See how people really feel. MoodView will not be held responsible for an over-proliferation of friends or increased workloads due to newfound business opportunities. MoodView's micro-expression data bank brought to you by the UAE High... Okay. So, MoodView, at the beginning you see this disc. I wonder where they put that disc. I'm kind of curious about that part. This is another one called DreamStream. Design your dreams and share it with your social network. Not quite sure how it works, but I guess you put that strip on your head and it somehow captures your dreams and you can share it on Facebook, which is kind of a cool idea, but kind of weird. So I talked to Andrew Her Herseger, who's the strategy director for this project, and I was like, wow, this is so awesome. On the government level, how, do, how, are, how are the people of Dubai responding to this design fiction? Are the, is the government actually implementing change because of the responses that they've seen? He said, don't call it design fiction. These prototypes are based on fictitious realities, but they're based on real provable drivers. So many consultancies actually worked on this, on this exhibition together, and they really looked at, it was a think tank, basically. Plausible scenarios, pr processes that hinge on the most plausible future based on rigorous research. The objects you see in this ex exhibition are not science fiction. They are based on real technologies that they are working on today. It's just gonna take a few years for it to actually be developed and then implement to society. Project number two, the, for the first time in history, or so they say, the government.uk has, um, and their future foresight division, has actively sought out speculative design as a method of design research for looking at the future of aging. So in the next 30 or, 30 or so years, we're gonna have to, we're gonna need certain services. And what's that world gonna look like? In three different cities, they did a workshop and showed them several different pictures on the future of work, the future of mobility and transportation. And they asked citizens how they felt about the state versus private services. So here, I know this picture is really blurry, I'm sorry, but here is a Facebook uh, autonomous carport. You can see here the signage as, um, this is an advertisement, this is an autonomous car road. I think there's a Google carport here as well. How do, you, how do they feel about a privately run service versus a government service? So a government bus versus a Facebook bus. And of course, people don't really trust private services because they think they're just gonna capitalize on citizens and try to make money. But again, it also elicited a lot of other questions about the services we'll need and how we might accept or adopt or not adopt certain technologies as they become more prevalent. Simone Rabadengo did a really interesting project called Future of Algorithms. So everything is smart nowadays, right? Your smartphone, your smart coffee maker, your smart home, everything's smart. How smart really is it? So what happens when the smart thing breaks? So the pre I like videos, by the way. You're gonna see a few more of them, but, but they're really good stories to tell. Um, the premise of this video is this man wakes up, he's sleeping, and his smart coffee maker starts making coffee in the middle of the night, and he's like, oh, I gotta get up and make the coffee here. Wait, it's broken, it's not time. So it does this a few times, he's like, I gotta take this thing to the shop. So what is that shop? Hello. <laughs> Object. 從直線開始。你看。
方便我设置需我需要的一些环境，然后以供 Object 在里面呢自动学习，直到它们学成为止。The rest of that online. Yeah, so smart objects, what are we gonna do with them? What new services will be available or need to be available to service them, maintain them? So what do we have to, get to, to consider when designing for the future? I'll give you a couple of basic frameworks that we use. One thing we like to do is called retrocasting. So if you were in my workshop yesterday, I made someone translate Moore's Law which is basically that, and I'll try and do a better job if I can of translating for myself, which is uh, the more transistors every year doubles. So every few years, you can compact more transistors, more firepower basically into a smaller space. And we see that happening with technology today. So there's an exponential curve, yeah? 1996 is 20 years ago. That's when Google was first, um, the, ad the advent of Google, 2007. 10 years ago, we didn't have the iPhone. Does anyone remember what it was like to actually remember a phone number in their head or use a paper map? Do you remember how hard that was? 2009, Uber, car sharing services, the sharing economy emerges. Today, we have Oculus and the watch. The watch maybe not getting, not as popular, but wearables in general are getting more popular. 20 years ago, cultural shifts. How did we interact, not just with technology, with ourselves? How did the nuclear family interact with, it, with itself? So that's 20 years. Now, if you apply Moore's law of exponential innovation, and you start to apply it to society and how we've shifted, you can start to think about, well, what that means in the last 20 years, that shift, the innovation, the evolution, who we are as a culture and a society could probably happen in the next 10 years. That means that the following 10 years after 2026, we have no idea because it's sort of hard to predict. Once you get past 10 years, it gets, gets kind of fuzzy. But can you imagine in 10 years how different our life will be today? When we do these workshops, we tell people, no websites, no mobile phones, no iPhone, no Apple. Don't consider that Apple will still be here 10 years from now. And think about what design really means. It doesn't have to be technology-based. It can be a service, it can be an idea, it can be a scenario, and don't just consider a device or electronics. How is it gonna shift who we are? This is, this, is, this is backcasting. A lot of people do it. You basically project into the future and you say, this is what I want, and you backcast backwards into the present. Here are the milestones or the pieces of technology that need to be developed for us to get here. You can do a very quick, um, brainstorm map and have different outcomes. So the alternate futures of the futures code. Here are three different areas that we want to go as a company to develop our technology. So Microsoft does this, Apple does this, and here are all the different places that it could go, the paths and everything that we need to build to create the foundation to get to that future. We talked earlier about impact, yeah? So we lob that future idea in 10 years into the future, it basically explodes because it affects people, and vice versa. It implodes as well because the society, the ecosystem that it lives in has an impact on it. We have to think about when we're designing for the future, whether it be five years or the next week, well, next week not so different because it's pretty much like today, but 10 years from now, which will be very different, what is the ecosystem? What are the challenges? Can we really predict what politics might be like? I wish we could, but it's really hard. But certain things are imminent population increases, terrorism, all this stuff, I'm sorry to tell you, it's gonna exist. I'm sorry that this is, there's a lot of grim topics in here, but these are things we need to think about. Not just users, they are important to actually use our devices and our applications, but how about the cultural implications? What impact will it have? Consider the bicycle, okay? Simple device, transportation, been around for about 200 years, hasn't really changed, two wheels, a, a seat, gotten a little bit more efficient in performance. You know, we've got roads, lots of in infrastructures that we need to create for it. This is Copenhagen, Denmark, 
the, the number one most bike-friendly city in the, in the world, I think. Lots of bike roads. Lots of services, whether you see them or not. Physical services, um, invisible services that are necessary for it. It has an impact on all these things, whether you believe it or not. And all these things have an impact on it. One simple piece of transportation, one design, one object. Now let's move forward to something that we're going to have to deal with in the next five years that'll probably be ubiquitous. Maybe semi-autonomous vehicles first, and then autonomous vehicles. How's it going to change the way we interact with each other? If Hyperloop was a reality today, you can actually move people from large, great distances very quickly. Don't you think that's going to change our economies, our religions, the way that we interact? A couple years ago at IXDA, I was in a workshop with Near Future Labs. They're uh, an agency, global agency, that specializes in design fiction. And they, the premise of the workshop was create the quick start guide for an autonomous car. So you're going to get in the car, and how do you get started? You know, just like you're getting your Fitbit. You've got this little pamphlet you open up, and all the important things of how do you actually turn the thing on and get set up and all that stuff, right? So there's a lot of stuff you have to think about. What happens if you leave your, car, your child in the car? What happens if you get lost? How do you wash it? How do you clean it? Where are the insurance policies? This thing is going to be connected to the internet. It will be an IoT device, or it is a device. Who owns that data? Earlier this year, Tesla's first fatality was reported. The first fatality of the vehicle actually killing a man. We live in a post-traumatic reactive design society. We wait for things to break and for people to die or catastrophes to happen before we can actually fix them. We need to start being a little bit more proactive, whether we like it or not, whether it's dystopic or not, and start to imagine what are all of the challenges, but also the opportunities, how we can fix them, make sure that we can't plan for everything, but we can start to think more holistic about the future. Honda did a, re, uh, a design fiction vision video recently about autonomous cars, and this is actually really good. I'm only going to show one of the cars, but they did, I think, seven. I think the, the overview is for the brief was to do one car, but when they looked at the project they wanted to do, they ended up doing, I think, seven different cars. Since the beginning of human history, mankind has continually sought to travel beyond its limits, starting in Africa and spreading all over the globe. Inspired by this tenacity, we decided to retrace one of the longest routes of human migration using vehicles with autonomous car technology. Think about the possibilities of autonomous car technology. It's a key innovation for the automotive industry, but this exciting technology is currently used to address practical issues like congestion, parking and safety. What we are missing is the dream. What if this technology was used to further human enjoyment and exploration? What kind of autonomous vehicle would this make possible? The next leg of the journey takes us from Karachi to Shenzhen, and this vehicle is called the Mountain Climber. The vehicle itself is very robust, and it has a steel tube with glass at either end, the tube protecting its occupants, but the glass windows either end providing an amazing view. Most of the journey is traversing the Himalayas, where rockfalls are quite frequent. One special feature of this vehicle, inspired by Honda's Asimo technology, uh, four robotic legs that enable it to lift itself and walk over any rock falls and also a robotic arm so that it can fix the road as it passes through the landscape. We have thousands of years of history to draw upon to inspire us to create great designs to take hold of this technology and make something really beautiful out of it. In 1987, design fiction is not, not a new thing. Apple did a uh, design fiction video. I wish I could show it, but I don't think there's time. Uh, the Apple Knowledge Navigator. So it's a short video about this professor using this, uh, back then, a fictitious device that looked like a tablet. He opened it up, touch screen, with a little butler that spoke to him that sort of looked like Screech from Saved by the Bell. Does anyone know that? Just showed my age again. Um, and there's a camera, and he's actually talking to another person somewhere. And so the internet was not ubiquitous at this point, sending files. Uh, collaborating on document. What is this? What is this device in 1987? This is the iPad and Siri and Skype 
all technologies that they knew that were, were being worked on, but they couldn't solve right just yet because we didn't, write, we didn't really have the firepower for it. This is, this is what they backcasted and created the iPad with and all the other technologies that you see today. And there's probably a lot more really cool stuff coming from them as well. So as I said, I run a small meetup in San Francisco, about a year and a half old. It's called Speculative Futures. We have a chapter in San Francisco and a small chapter in, in Austin. We work with South by Southwest. Uh, I work for GE. And we have uh, GE facilitators and researchers who teach the workshops. Cooper, I'm not sure if you guys know Cooper, the consultancy in San Francisco. We are partners with them. Um, but we're, what we're really trying to do here is uh, democratize this process. We're trying to, I do not believe that speculative and critical design needs to be relegated to universities, university programs, or museums, or the occasional video, marketing video that someone has a lot of money to create. I believe that we can actually use this just as Tellart has used it, or the future of, or the gov.uk, to actually really set agendas, set a path towards a preferable future. And this is what we're trying to do by teaching these workshops. New Harvest is a nonprofit that's looking at cellular agriculture. So they're trying to synthesize animal byproducts without the animals, eggs without chickens, milk without cows. I think they just, they've got ground beef now without cows. And we're gonna be working with them on a larger workshop to think about the policies and the ethical challenges. And there are ethics because cells are living things. You don't really think about that because an animal's not involved. And look at them at looking, looking with them at the potential products that we, they might have to develop. We ran a uh, design lab earlier this year looking at the future of disease in 2026. So we, we got six subject matter experts, but this format seems to work really well. We just did this on Monday at South by Southwest Eco. We had a subject matter expert from data science, IT, genomics, biotechnology, VR, and wearables. And 30 designers, we put an SME in each group, and over two days they designed um, solutions for disease in 2026. So they could choose whatever disease they want. Some did depression, PTSD, pandemics, diabetes, through the lens of that particular scientific field. So the wearable one was, was pretty cool. Um, this was a project where they took, so we looked at signals. I'm not sure I told you about signals, but in the future cone, we look at a signal, which is basically a sign or a trend of something that we can project, yeah? So these are the single signals that we looked at for this project called Genomi, plant genomics, oops plant genomics, biosensing, which you're doing a lot today, and machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I thought this was a really beautiful response. So this is a plant. Now, I didn't tell them no, no mobile devices, but apparently they, they like to have the mobile device and they, you give a, a blood sample to it and it goes in this plant and the plant generates fruits based on your health needs. So medicines, vitamins, all produced from this. So this is actually a real technology they're working on, programming organics, programming plants. Another project called HEAL, where they're looking at the quantified self biohacking, wearables, I think this was a wearables group, uh, machine learning and 3D printing. These are all popular technologies we're using today. How might we project that 10 years into the future? So they created this, uh, so one guy was a 3D renderer, so it's a little bit more polished, but basically this is the sleeve that you would wear and these little um, pods were pods you would 3D print at home that actually had medicinal packets on them. So if you got sick, you just put a little headache pod on you. Or if you have diabetes, put a little insulin pod on you. And it's fashionable too. If you guys are interested in more speculative design, there are three books. Uh, Landscape Future is a very good one. This is pretty much the seminal book by Dunn and Raby on speculative everything. It's, it's got a lot of great projects and examples of speculative design over the years from uh, not just by them and their students, but people all over the world. Reframe, I like to tell people about this one because it's a very good book on reframing. So the um, the exercise is making you recontextualize something. When you're synthesizing, whether it be today or tomorrow or 10 years from now, let's just say you take an object, uh, a toothbrush, and you want to reframe the object. It's not this stick you put in your mouth anymore, it's a plant, okay? So if this plant was a toothbrush, how would I actually have to design it? How would I package it? What would it be make, made of? Biodegradable, all that stuff. It still does the same thing. The goals and objectives and the users are the same, but you've reframed what it is. This is a very powerful synthesis technique to understand now you add the future context on top of that and you can get some really interesting, really innovative ideas. So lastly, if you don't believe me, if you think this stuff is all science fiction, the least you can do is think about the future and use it as a method or platform of synthesis to come up with some new ideas because we call it a wormhole basically. 
you might spend a couple hours in a workshop doing this work and thinking, oh, this is what it's gonna be like in 2026. It's gonna be so cool, and here's this thing, and it's gonna be awesome. It doesn't have to live there. You can bring it closer to you and actually use that to create either an agenda towards that or actually start working on it. New Zealand is one of the, at least as we know it, one of the, the last untouched places on earth. It's a very beautiful place. This is a place where innovation can thrive. For all you guys who are designers out there, you're all designers of the future. You know, some people, some people say, well, the future is tomorrow. Yeah, it is tomorrow. It's also 10 years, it's also 20 years, and it's also for your children. That's for surprise. Last thing, future belongs to you. There's a future that you can design and that you can execute. Don't wait. Make tomorrow today. Thanks. <laughs>